My name is Sandrine Dixon de Cleve, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Oslo and to launch this absolutely fabulous project that we've done together with Zinteo. And I'll say fabulous because it's coming at a time that we absolutely need. We need to address not only the leaders and to have more leaders as we've just seen, like the Prime Minister, who's taking her leadership absolutely personally as a moral responsibility to do the right thing, not only in the area of the environment, but also in the area of social responsibility. Europe delivers has been working with a series of different experts, leaders, NGOs, knowledge holders, think tanks, to really think through what are the grand challenges for Europe. How can we unlock some of this leadership within all of us? How can we actually work together and look at the challenge of the future of work? How can we work together and look at the challenge of a resilient economy? a green economy, the tipping points around climate change and species extinction, what does that actually mean? How do we work together to ensure that European leadership is one that is anchored in social welfare, but by the same token, innovation, competitiveness, and good policy leadership? And how do we ensure that we can compete within a global structure and bring all of that together? Not say that we need to undercut our labor, not say that we need to reap the benefits of our resources and actually move forward in a destructive way, but actually build new bridges, find ways to move together through some of these grand challenges. So it's my deep pleasure to introduce some of the Europe Delivers champions. If they could please come up and join me. And also the India team who have been working in India and have been very much looking at similar types of challenges within an Indian context. So I'm going to ask you to join me as well. And what we want to do <laughs> in the little bit of time that we have is to unpack some of these challenges that we've been talking about, again, from a European context, and then move into the Indian context, taking into consideration that we are looking at new leadership. And leaders are not just the usual distinction of leaders. Who's a leader? We're a leader. You're a leader. We're all leaders. We have to show our communities what it means to be a leader. So I'm going to start, actually, with Wolfgang Schüssel, who is sitting on our advisory board, but also former Chancellor of Austria. And Wolfgang, it's such a pleasure to have you here. What, from your perspective, does it mean to be part of Europe Delivers, but also to look at those grand challenges, in particular from a policy spectrum that you've been so fundamentally involved in? Three points. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I attended two studios uh, in the afternoon and the morning session. It was really great, uh, interesting, inspiring debates and uh, very good results. Uh, second, uh, probably you remember in the morning there was uh, behind me uh, a sentence. Uh, we are confronted 1918, 2018 with the same problems uh, like uh, a century ago. I completely disagree because we learned our lesson. Uh, before we founded the European Union, I know Norway is not, not member, but part of, uh, very much linked to the European Union. Before we founded the European Union, we had, during the last 300 years, 123 wars among members of the today's European Union. So we learned our lesson, and today Europe as such is uh, still the place to live. Peace, prosperity, stability, freedom, uh, social cohesion, take it whatever, whatever it is. So second remark, I think Europe is still a powerful tool. We have uh, the largest uh, single market. We have powerful investments. Uh, don't forget, we are always talking about China and Africa. Europe imports twice as much from Africa than China, and we invest six times more FDIs, foreign direct investment, in Africa. But we are not doing it under the European label, but we're doing it individually. So, but we are still a yeah. powerful tool. And third argument, it's now the real moment to change. We have now, it was mentioned, next year's parliamentary election, 60% of, parliament, of the members of parliament will be the new generation. We will have a new commission, the new generation of leaders will come in. We have several uh, European leaders, Mike Chancellor, for instance, 32 years old. Yes, he is one of the youngest chancellors yeah, ever. And immediately, yes. the trust into the government, into the politics, went up by 20%. Yeah. So I think this means something. 
change is possible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm asked, I'm an optimist or a pessimist. No, I'm a possibilist. And I think it's important that everybody who leaves today or tomorrow will go home as a possibilist to make a better future Fantastic. Possible. So, Vanda, are you a possibilist as well? And we invited you very much because you've been an active member of our community, in particular looking at some of the social implications of what these grand challenges mean mm. for Europe. What is your thinking? I'm very encouraged by the work that we do with young people. And um, in the UK, the UK, the UN Special Rapporteur for Extreme Poverty came to visit, which was an absolute disgrace for our government. And we took 24 young people from a deprived estate in London, a group of learning disabled young people, and a group of young people who were migrants and refugees. And they told him the reality of living in London as young people. And they shared their experiences. And afterwards, they said, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I spoke to this UN rapporteur. And they were just all fired up to go and do something else. So they said, we want to speak to Parliament. They've now met with their local council. They've written an article for our national newspaper. And to see that transformation over six or eight months of young people who really felt that nobody was ever going to listen to them, to hear them talking about race, about homelessness, about sexism, about consumer culture, that means that they will spend money on a designer cap and then go to a food bank. Because the status that gives them amongst their peers will last far longer than the food that they will put in their stomachs. So it gives me hope, because I think if we can work with young people and we can tell them and we can encourage them to be the change agents they can be, then we do have a future. Thank you, Vanda. And in fact, that direct experience has been very much integrated in some of our solutions under the social contract. How do we bring leaders closer together to citizens and to those that are different parts of their communities so they understand some of the challenges that these individuals are facing? And I'm going to turn to you now, Henrik. Mm -hmm. Henrik Henriksen, as the CEO of Scania, you've been very active on our advisory board, as mm -hmm. well as you will have some special news for us this evening. Yes. But I think, very importantly, you also have specifically been working on how the social contract fits within Scania, the future of work, and looking at some of these grand challenges in your own discussions around Scania. Yeah, that's correct. We, uh, we have embraced that as, as a way of creating um, a company that is uh, future-proof, uh, I would say, and, and uh, referring to the Prime Minister's speech earlier, I would, I would so much sort of uh, support her idea of, of uh, that uh, in our organization we have 50,000 people. Uh, many of them are now facing a digitalization that will come. Uh, and of course, you could change 20,000 and replace them with 20 new, uh, but we cannot do that from our culture point of view. We need to do it uh, together with them because they are having a lot of knowledge and experience uh, knowing the customer, knowing the process, knowing the industry as such. And, and that's why we're retraining them and sort of reshaping them. Uh, so, so I think that is one example. But I would also like to connect to what you said before about uh, the leadership here. I think one leadership that is important from a business point of view is that we need to work very close and hand in hand with the policymakers. And the policymakers have to have the same attitude. We need to work together. It is that if we go as leaders and, and we see the same challenges and, and we also discuss uh, ways forward to sort of solve these challenges, I think that's when we take our responsibilities as leaders. Mm. If we work in these silos between business and policy, uh, we will not be able to transform Europe. And I think that is a strength that we need to be able to fulfill some of the ambitions we have in Europe delivers here. It is that we embrace the possibilities to, to, to work together and, and, and stretch across the aisle mm -hmm. and, and, and grab the hand and say, let's do this together. Then we will create the growth. We will create it in a sustainable way, which will be good for Europe, good for our people, but also good for us as, as a global leader. Mm -hmm. And I think as Dr. Schussel has indicated, and also the Prime Minister, we can't do it any other way because we're now faced with complex decision making and tipping points that are forcing us to collectively come together, otherwise we can't reach those challenges. Tell us a little bit about this new announcement that you have, because we're very excited about how we can work together on a concrete project within <laughs> Europe Delivers. Yeah, I'm also very excited. So, so now I will, I will uh, sort of crash the, the, the time schedule here, so uh, be aware. <laughs> uh, now, um, so I represent a company called Scania. Uh, we are part of an ecosystem uh, regarding transport and logistics. We deliver big trucks and big buses. Um, we represent as an ecosystem around 15 to 20% of the global CO2 in the world. 
So we are definitely part of a problem. Um, we have, however, decided to take a position in this uh, ecosystem to drive the shift towards more sustainable solutions. Um, we are doing that by addressing uh, the challenge with three pillars. It is about energy efficiency, it's about smart, connected, and safe uh, systems, but it's also about electrification that we heard about before and alternative fuels. The challenge here, though, is that um, if you look at the latest IPCC report, um, some of these inventions, they will take some time before they actually come through in results. And uh, if we take digitalization and electrification as an example, it will probably take us 10 years before we have the infrastructure, before we have elect electrical supply of energy like we have in Norway that is fossil free, um, and that we have the policy decision taken to sort of actually create this transformation and the technology. Um, and we cannot wait 10 years. Because the target that we set together in Paris in 2015, they are not waiting for that perfect technical solution. So we need to focus here and now. Mm. And, and that's why we need to address the challenge we have today with biofuels. Biofuels can address sort of the rolling population of heavy vehicles that is doing your transport, trucks and buses today, uh, and we can have an immediate effect. Um, this we cannot do alone. However, we need to do this together in partnership, and together with our customers, the transport company, but also together with our customers' customer, the ones that buy transport for their services. Um, we need to do it together with a supply chain of biofuels. That comes from the forestry industry, from the agriculture sector, and from waste that we create. You know, 600 toilets in a city is enough to fuel one biogas city, one biogas bus uh, for one year. So, so we have a lot of hidden potential. So we need to work together with the demand side, uh, with the supply side, but also with the policymakers. And we cannot do this alone. So that's why we are actually today launching, under the umbrella of Europe Delivers, the first project uh, where Scania today, uh, together with Sinteo, we are starting a product around Europe bioeconomy. Uh, because we believe if we work together, we will be able to identify the hurdles that is not sort of giving us the possibility to do this transformation here and now. We believe that together we will be able to put together a plan that will, will take away these hurdles and accelerate the transformation into a much more sustainable transport system. And I think that is going to be good for us that are participating yeah. in this, but it's going to be good for Europe. And it's going to be one of these examples that we can refer to that we actually took our responsibility and we did something. And th that is what we want to do, drive the shift. And I welcome you all to join us on that journey. Thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership. So I'm going to join, I'm going to ask you, Harry, um, coming from a Shell perspective, actually, you've got quite a bit of history in the biofuels area as well, having worked together on biofuels. Yeah, future. Um, but maybe you can remark a little bit around how you're seeing the leadership piece within an Indian context, because we also have a fantastic project that Zinteo is doing in India, bringing together policy leaders with business leaders. And maybe you can give us a bit of your impression of what is happening in India. Yeah, indeed, Sandrine, and, and thanks very much. And listening to the European story, I think there are many parallels, mm -hmm. uh, but also quite a few differences. And, and when I think of energy, for example, then, then one difference would be the, the scale and the nature of the challenge. Whereas in Europe, of course, when you look forward, say, the next 20 years, actually energy demand will probably be stable or maybe drop. Um, in India, that's not the case. I, if you look at the projections for India over the next 20 years or so, uh, one of the credible projections says that we will see a 170% increase in energy demand uh, in India and uh, 180% increase in energy production in the country itself, whether it be through gas or coal or renewables. A significant proportion of that will be renewables. What we will see between now and then is, is an, uh, not only increase in energy demand and consumption, but it also a decarbonization of the energy system because of the introduction of significant components of power and renewables. The power complex in India will triple in size in 20 years, unprecedented, it's really, really very significant. Uh, but not all that power will be provided by renewables. So if you look at the energy mix today, and then you wheel 20 years forward, Today, 93% of the energy mix in India is fossil fuels. 
But in 20 years' time, it was still 83%. And, and so if you think about that, then you, then you just can imagine the scale of the challenge because that transition, which is in its own right enormous, will actually not put us as a world on the path to one and a half degrees or so. And again, we can't underestimate the challenge in its own right that that puts India in front of. In terms and how do we shift that? How do we shift that? that well, challenge. we first have to get our minds around how we would get there all together, yeah. which involves investment, it involves infrastructure, it involves customer behavior, it involves governance and technology. So, so all these co components brought together in a completely new way. Because if we would do this the traditional way, say, as North America has experienced or Europe would do, then, of course, we are never going to even get close to that former scenario, let alone the one and a half mm. degree scenario. So what that meant for us is, is to look for different and new ways to grow and to participate in India's economy and deal with the challenges ahead. Uh, and, and one of the responses to that has been the, uh, the, the creation of the India 2022 platform, which approaches these issues in a very different way. Cross-sectoral, you know, to speak with the prime minister, much more holistic. So we're looking for sustainable solutions that involve partners that pre previously would probably never have worked together. So thinking about how we can create solutions where we take waste from agricultural and domestic India and turn that into clean fuels for transport. Yeah. Those are the kind of challenges we need to scale. And we can only do that together in ways that previously we, we would not have, not have been able to do. And so we're looking for ways to do that, which is why we conceived in the year 2022. Uh, excellent facilitation by, by Sinteo, but really the key component in, is, in it is leadership. And, and so we've been very blessed to have a great leader in the country, Nitin Prasad. I don't know if Nitin is, is in the audience today. Here. The youngest leader in energy in India. Over here. Uh, as he was put on the front page of Fortune magazine when he was appointed. <laughs> but a very different style and, 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 uh, and way of leading. And, and then we've been blessed to find our, our chairman in this initiative, Sanjeev Mehta. Uh, as a real heavyweight within Indian business and society to be able to help us propel that, uh, that initiative forward. We're very happy to see others join, uh, but maybe we can talk about it after the, uh, Wonderful. the session. So Sanjeev, I'm going to point to you now. Um, and actually interesting to also talk about this bioeconomy project because that also has quite an impact on food and how land is used in Unilever and Hindustan. And your role is fundamental. I mean, you've taken a, a wonderful role in, in the Indian case. How do you see this? And, and maybe also reflect a little bit on how we can maybe all sure. collaborate as sure. to uh, we move forward. Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, as we say in India, namaste. Namaste. Uh, I think it's very important that I give you a bit of perspective of India before we get into the Zintio India 2022 coalition. It's been about 71 years since we got our independence. And when we got our independence, we were virtually bankrupt. We did not even have enough food grains to feed our population. So it was a struggle, it was a democracy, it was building institutions, growing the country. And in the first 30, 35 years, we grew at about just three, three and a half percent. And most of that three, three and a half percent was eaten away by the growth in the population. And uh, that is when later on, after having established the base, India started accelerating. And in the last 35 years, we have doubled the growth rate. And in the last 20 years, and especially since 1991, when we opened up the economy, we have been growing at anywhere between 65 to 7% compounded. And today, India is a $2.5 trillion economy. About in 1991, our per capita income was about $350. It is now uh, close to $1,800. And if we were to just extrapolate at the present rate of growth. And India has be, is now the fastest growing large economy. India would be about six to seven trillion dollar economy by 2030. That's the momentum rate of growth. Now, if you were to bend the curve, India could well be a $10 trillion economy by 2030. Yeah, that would mean we would be middle income, most of the population would be out of the poverty trap, but it also has its huge implications and consequences. India has its fair degree of challenges. We are a country of 1.3 billion people, 
And India is one of the youngest countries in the world with a median population of 25. The largest chunk of millennials in the world are in India. So we are talking about having to create livelihoods of about, for about, a million people every month. That's the biggest challenge. Second is, can India ape the Europe or the US when it comes to per capita fossil fuel consumption? The answer is no, certainly not. Just imagine the impact India would have if we were to have the same per capita consumption as the developed countries of today. So India will have to have a very different business model of growth. India will not replicate what happened in the post-industrial Western world or in China lately about farm to factory. As an Indian minister rightly said, the Indian growth model could well be farm to frontier using data, using technology, using the India stack, and not having a walled gardens around us, but creating ecosystem which could be harnessed for the benefit of the society, be it precision manufacturing, be it agriculture, improving the agriculture produce in the country. So it's very important that we put our heads around to bring sustainable solutions for India, because let's accept it, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't solve the problem of India and China, we won't be able to solve the problem of the world. At the end of the day, this too will be amongst the three top economies in the world, and together constitute one third of the population. And that is where Zintio 2022 comes in. A bit about myself, I work for a wonderful company called Unilever. I run the Indian arm called Hindustan Unilever. We are the largest consumer goods company in the country. Unilever, over the last decade, has been experimenting with a fabulous business model. We call it the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And the whole purpose of the plan is, how do you grow the business while decoupling it with the environment footprint and recoupling it with the social impact. It's a journey. But I think what is behind the journey is the purpose. What is behind the journey is the concept of compassionate capitalism. And we have a fabulous leader in Paul Pullman, which many of you would be mm -hmm. knowing, who's making a tremendous difference to thought leadership in this space. We need to clone Paul oh. Pullman, by the way. Sorry? We really need to clone Paul. Absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately, Absolutely. he says it himself. Absolutely. He needs more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, you know, he's a remarkable he leader. And is. what a footprint he's left in the world and, of course, in Unilever. Now, that's where we come to Zintio 2022. And under the stewardship of the fabulous gentleman called Oswal, let's give him a big round of applause. Yeah. Is we set about bringing a coalition of business. This is not NGOs. This is not politics. This is about business coming together. And uh, we have fabulous companies. Yeah, we have Shell. Yeah, is, uh, we have GE. We have Technib. Uh, Henry is sitting over there. We have Scient, uh, my business, Unilever. And then we have two of the most reputed groups in India, the Tatas and the Billas, represented by Mrs. Billa over here. Mm. And the whole idea was that how do we come together to try to bring our passion, our technology, our thought leadership, the best practices to solve some of the real intractable problems facing the country today. And to start with, we picked up four thematic ideas. One is, of course, energize. Yeah, how do we bring in better energy, renewable energy, in a much more cost-effective way? Second is low-cost healthcare. Again, so important to improve the quality of life in the country. The third is sustainable mining. Yeah, it's very important because India will need mining in a big way for many years to come. 
But if you look at it today, mining again, it's, uh, there is a negative connotation, connotation associated with it. How do we bring in sustainable practices which would be good for the society and create minimal damage to the ecology? And the uh, fourth important one was waste to value. And at the heart of the waste to value is plastic. Plastic, which, is, uh, which has done a phenomenal job. I think a great invention of our generation, which has allowed uh, great plastic. products yeah. accessible to the masses at affordable prices, but it's now become a public enemy number one, a bit like tobacco. Because the question is not about plastic per se, but the end use of plastic or the waste or the litter. And that's a big issue in the country. So that is where we have come together. It's a journey we have commenced. Yes. And I'm very happy to tell you that in the last one odd year, thanks to the leadership of people like Harry, Henry, uh, the Billas, we have started working together. And it's not going to be easy. But again, if we put our might together, I certainly believe we can act as a catalyst to make changes and bring about what we call as the responsible growth in the country. Is there any alternative to responsible growth? Certainly not. The society expects the business so to I regain the trust. Yes. And that is where it comes in. That's where the role of Zintio India 2022 coalition comes in. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And let me just make one observation, which is we both, in our regional distinctions, have come up with four challenges, four key challenges. So maybe I could just ask you very quickly, each of you, to give us what you think is the key leadership solution in a couple of words as we move down the line and then we're going to have to close because I think we, we don't have a, a huge amount of extra time. But I want to give you the opportunity, rather than just talking about challenges, to give us one or two key thoughts very quickly. And I'll start with you, Vanda. <laughs> On the spot. Um, for me, I think it's about being able to utilize everybody's talents and to widen and broader, broaden our ideas of leadership so that we're not just looking at the same faces, so that we can include people, um, we can include a much wider range of, of leaders in terms of diversity, in terms of sexual orientation, gender, in terms of race, ethnicity, in terms of religion or faith or non, and also in terms of being a Brit, and I must say a proud European, <laughs> also in terms of class and socioeconomic background, because otherwise we're just having the same problems and we're just coming up with the same solutions. Thank you. Wolfgang. Creating trust is, in my opinion, the most important thing uh, for, for the leaders of tomorrow. Creating trust is uh, the basis for everything. And uh, I think we should, we, the older generation, me as a dinosaur, yeah, we should really trust the next generation. They are better equipped, better educated, they are better connected, they are much more open-minded. And therefore, I think, I think we should really trust the next generation. Trust is the key word. Thank you for that. Henrik? Uh, yeah, I would also um, think that as leaders, we need to embrace diversity. I think that is how you build strong teams uh, with a mix of different experiences and different backgrounds. That is also how you will be able to tackle the pace and speed of how change is coming at us. So I think diversity is, is the base. And then uh, as, as individuals, I think also the, the most important thing as, as leaders is not to be a crocodile. I mean, it's, it's to, you need to have the other way. You shouldn't have a big Which mouth animal? and small e e ears. You should rather be an elephant, I think. Oh. Uh, sort of like with big, so big ears. Less on the ego, <laughs> yeah. more on the soul and the heart. Yeah. Use your probably. ears. And yeah. use your ears. Yeah. yeah, we do have a lot That's of leaders we who don't two. know how to listen. We have two of those and one of this. So. Do, you, do you think people <laughs> have forgotten that aspect? Yeah. I actually think you're absolutely right. <laughs> Harry. Yeah, I would say uh, working together authentically and with integrity. Uh, and that's not an easy balance to strike. But, but if working together only amounts to shutting up and, uh, and, and making things work, then we fail to confront the big issues that are in front of us. And these are not easy challenges to surmount. So I think that integrity and authenticity is really important. But, but indeed, if that goes hand in hand with crocodile jaws, then we're not <laughs> going to find solutions either. OK, and Sanjeev. You know, I'll just quote from a very famous Indian epic, Mahabharata, 
during good times and bad, during success and failure, treat things if it were impacting your own self. And that is where the concept of compassionate capitalism comes in. Good. So thank you. So I'm, I'm going to close with that, and I, I would really like to thank you all for your incredible leadership. So first of all, a round of applause for all of you. Thank, thank you. you. And let's keep up the good work, both in thank India you. and in Europe. And as we said, let's talk more to each other in order to help optimize our thinking and our solution building. And I'm going to leave you all with a few thoughts. So what is a good leader, a compassionate leader, one who listens, one who understands the key importance of diversity, who builds trusting relationships, but also is someone that you can trust? And let's make sure that we don't think about either the old guys and the dinosaurs or just the crocodiles, because actually we need intergenerational leaders. We need the new and we need the old, and we need to learn to work together, and that's part of the problem. And let's also very much remember that good leadership means that you listen first, then you think, then you act. So I'd like to leave that with you, and maybe with one last few words, which is be the leader that you want to see and make sure that you ask for the leadership that you want in office and that you want to lead you. Thank you very much.